This is the village of Lubra, a small settlement of just 16 houses beside the Panda Kola, an eastern tributary of the Kali Gandaki River. The main cultural importance of Lubra lies in the fact that it is the earliest surviving community of the Bun religion in Nepal. Bun is the native cultural and spiritual tradition of Tibet and the Himalayan borderlands. It dates back thousands of years and its teachings of wisdom and compassion have come down through the ages in an unbroken lineage of adepts. This tradition is also rich in methods of working with the natural elements. Since prehistoric times, Bun has played a significant role in the religious and cultural development of numerous peoples in Central Asia. Although there are many traditions referred to as Bun, the most authentic form was propagated by the Buddha Tumpa Shenrab, whose teachings map out an effective and all-encompassing system for attaining ultimate enlightenment. Lama Geshe Geleg Jimpa, a Bun monk from Kathmandu, has just arrived here in Lubra and is meeting some of the villagers to discuss an exciting trip he is planning. Last year, in a remote cave in the mountains of Upper Mustang, many Bunpo texts were discovered and an international team of experts have invited Geshe Geleg to help them recover these precious documents. The abbot of his monastery, Kempo Tempo Yundrung, has also charged Geshe Geleg with undertaking a survey of the Bonpo cultural traditions of Mustang. This is for an organization called the Bun Mahasanga of Nepal. When the villagers of Lubra found out that the monk was on his way to Upper Mustang to find a cave with ancient texts, they called a general meeting and decided to provide the expedition with horses, provisions and all other necessities. <laughs> Several people were eager to go with them. So, Lama Tsultrim, the local priest or Hlaban, Dawa, the village chief, and Bara Norbu, a teacher from the local Chase Kense Bumpo school, are going to accompany Geshe Geleg on this journey. This film follows Geshe Geleg on his travels through Mustang to the caves of Mar Zong and to various Bunpo settlements where he discovers many hidden treasures of his tradition. Geshe Geleg left Tibet in 1992 to study with the venerated master Yongzin Tenzin Namdak Rinpoche at the Triten Norbutse Monastery in Kathmandu. After 14 years of intense study, he received his Geshe degree. Now he teaches his fellow monks as well as visiting Europe to support Western students of Bern. Apart from teaching, he 
He also continues his research into the history of his tradition and is particularly interested in Shangsheng, an ancient empire which ruled Tibet and many other regions of Central Asia. Bun was the main religious tradition here until it was replaced by Indian Buddhism in the 8th century. Geshe Geleg's first trip to research Bun and Shangsheng was in 2002 when he went around Mount Kailash, believed to be the sole mountain of the Shangsheng kings. Now, six years later, he is visiting Mustang, formerly in the south of Shangsheng. On the border of Lower and Upper Mustang, the party pause to make ritual offerings to the Drabla protector gods and to the local gods and spirits of the land. Prayer flags, known as Lungta, are hung and many more are scattered in the wind accompanied by prayers for good luck on the journey, success in finding the cave and in recovering the texts. On the way past Tamagang, the party met a local man, Sharab Tenzin. He urged them to take lunch with him in nearby Giling. But unfortunately, there was no time to visit the village at that stage, as Gelig and his team were expected in Lomontang. But they promised to visit the Bun families there on the way back. And so they continued on their way. Before arriving in Lomontang, the party, tired out, spend the night in the nearby village of Tsarong. A big summer festival had just finished there that very day. While talking with the local people about their expedition to the Bun Cave, they were excited to hear that there was a Hla Bun lineage here too. The Hla Bun is an extremely important figure in the community. He is the community's priest and performs many rituals for the villagers. The Hla Bun is an expert in invoking long life and prosperity. He also calls rain and sends away bad spirits. This is Tashi Hlundrub, the present Laban of Tsarang. A warm welcome awaited Geshe Geleg at his house. They were shown many precious religious artifacts and texts, as well as official documents given to the Laban of this lineage by the kings of Mustang. Tashi Hlundrup was happy to tell them all about the history and customs of this annual summer festival. Mm -hmm. 
So this year, the villagers wanted to follow this ancient custom exactly, and they had asked Tashi Lundrup to preside over the festival. After thousands of years passed, this tradition is still alive today. When Geshi Geleg arrived in Lomontang next morning, he got a message that the team waiting for them had already set off for the caves and that he should join them the next day. This time they were lucky. Their visit coincided with the start of a very similar summer festival called Yatong. So the monk and his friends were able to join the festivities in the village and experience this revived tradition for themselves. In centuries past, Lomontang was part of the Shangsheng Empire, which once stretched through all of Tibet and beyond in the days before Buddhism was introduced to the region from India in the 8th century. Bun had flourished here, and many Dzogchen yogis had made their hermitages in various locations throughout the land. Here in Lomontang, the party met up with another local Bunpo, a relative of Tashi Lundrup, called Drep Gurung. He was delighted to see fellow Bunpos and offered to show them around. In the evening, Geshe Geleg was invited to the house of the royal Hla Bun, whose family had served as priests to the king of Mustang for generations. The old Laban had passed away, leaving behind two sons and a daughter. One son became a Sakya monk and another went to live in America. So now nobody is keeping the lineage. As a result, the office of royal Laban has passed into the Nyingma school of Buddhism. Nevertheless, Geshe Geleg was able to meet the old Laban's daughter, who showed him many marvelous religious objects, relics and texts. Among these were very rare Bunpo manuscripts, which had been kept intact and used since the times of the first king of Mustang, Agun Zangpo. They were still in use right up until the death of the last Laban. <coughs> Another Bun visitor to Lo Mung Tang was the very great Dzogchen master Karu Drobwang Rinpoche, who came here in the first half of the 19th century. In his autobiography, he describes how he visited this area and met the king of Mustang, Jampo Dadhu, and his two Bumpo Laban priests, Dangsong Trowo 
and Tennam. This was a largely Sakya area. Dubwang Rinpoche debated with some Sakya monks and the two Labuns were delighted to meet someone from their tradition who had the scholarly skills of debate. The next day, Geshe Geleg and his group went eastwards from Lomontang to Marzong to meet with a team of filmmakers from the National Geographic Channel. The team included several expert climbers and specialists from all over the world. One of them is Dr. Charles Ramble of Oxford University, a specialist in Tibetan and Himalayan studies, particularly Bun traditions. The crew were making a film about caves in Mustang and were keen to film here in Mardzong as the previous year the climbers alerted by local shepherds, had discovered a cave full of texts. The villagers of Lomantang joined in. Some monks from the nearby Sakya monastery offered to help clean the texts. The filmmaker, Liesel Athens and her team, had also asked for Geshe Geleg's cooperation in sorting out the thousands of loose pages he was delighted to be able to help. The plan is to preserve these rare texts in the Lomantang Library. Marzong is a very beautiful place full of caves which in the past had served as dwellings for Shangsheng people. Dr. Ramble, the well-known climber Peter Athens, with his team of climbers, and a cameraman, made the tricky ascent up into the caves where the books had been found. Charles is saying about 1%, and Jeff will be probably interested to know that, from what Charles has said, the, the illuminations are, are almost exclusively bond posts. Consensus is based on the official side, is that we should not uh, be involved in removing uh, the Feldio. Um, we'll discuss that further, um, but it has to do with the fact that That's a good job. Yeah. You can grab onto my feet if you want. Yeah, I'm really solid. You can yeah. wait me. That's it, Carl. Yeah, stay over your feet. That's it. That's good. Yeah, over the edge, it's running over rocks that are sharp. Charles is coming! 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 <laughs> they carefully gathered up the pages and loaded them in sacks, which were then lowered to the ground. 
Then the pages were cleaned and meticulously sorted. A truly mammoth task. It would be better to get at least started with this small load. There's a few eliminations, a bunch of the small text, and then some just general scripture. Load coming down now. The team set about the job eagerly, excited to see what treasures they had discovered. It soon became clear from the colophons in the texts that these copies had been made in Buncor at the time of the first king of Mustang, Agon Zangpo, who probably reigned in the 14th century. Most of the texts turned out to be important sutra and tantra scriptures. One exciting find was the Kamchen Tongtrak Japa. This is one of Bun's main sutras, consisting of the discourse of the Buddha of Bun, Tanpa Sherab Miwo. Originally, it was in 16 volumes. It is commonly believed that early Bun was a largely shamanistic tradition based solely on rituals with no higher teachings mapping out the path of liberation and with no written texts. This text, the Kam Chen, found here in the Marzong cave, clearly puts paid to this notion. It contains teachings on compassion, the ten parameters, the five paths, and so it gives clear instructions on the path to liberation. The colophon here clearly shows that this text was commissioned even before Agen Zangpo became king. Here it says, the great secretary of defense, Agon Zangpo, commissioned the text and used it as a practice manual. And so this Kam Chen text alone is clear proof that ancient Bun did indeed include ultimate teachings. The Kam Chen was translated from the Shangsheng language by the great Shangsheng yogi and scholar Tongjung Tuchen, working with the Tibetan scholar Sharin Uchen. During the persecutions in the reign of the Tibetan king Drigum Tsenpo, it was hidden and rediscovered by the great master Shenchen Luga in the 11th century. Another significant find was three volumes of a text known as the Lubum. All three volumes are the speech of Buddha Tunpa Shenrab and Bonpos believe they were translated from the language of Shangsheng into Tibetan. Among other texts discovered were many important texts of Bompo Sutra and Tantra. The caves had obviously been looted over the years and the team were dismayed to discover the title pages of the majority of texts were missing. Title pages are always extremely beautiful, written in exquisite calligraphy with silver and gold paint worth a lot to looters.
Bunpo, and he mentioned Buncor too. When Geshe Geleg heard this name again, he immediately asked its whereabouts. The old man pointed to the northwest mountains. And so the travelers eagerly set off in that direction. In days gone by, Buncor was a vast monastery, a hive of learning and practice. The texts mention it by name, but few details are known. This lack of information goes back to the time when Indian Buddhism was introduced into Tibet. This triggered a wave of antagony towards Bun. Many monasteries were destroyed and texts were systematically burned. So not many textual sources survived this persecution. One of the most complete biographies is that of the great Dzogchen master, Yangtun Sherab Jaltsen, a lineage holder of the Shangsheng Nianju. According to his biography, at that time, the monastery was still functioning. We also know that this Sherab Jaltsen was closely associated with such lamas as Drutong Jitsung, Sebon Trujal, and Larinyempo. Historical records clearly state that these lamas all lived in the first quarter of the 11th century. So by fitting the pieces of the puzzle together, Geshe Geleg was able to deduce that the great monastery of Bunkor must have been thriving as late as the 11th century. The ruins of Bunkor clearly show it was once a huge monastery. The buildings are in two levels. Local people still call it Bunkor and say that the upper levels were occupied by the high lamas while monks lived on the lower level. Geshe Geleg had never imagined it could be such a large place. In the center of the complex are the ruins of the Seikang or main temple. These are flanked by the other buildings, which form five layers. Outside are rings of many ruined stupas. The whole complex looks like a big mandala. We cannot understand clearly from the historical texts exactly when the monastery was destroyed. But according to the local people, the nearby Sakya monastery Namjal Gompa was constructed with the materials from Bonkor, which was ransacked at that time. Another place the old man of Lomontang had mentioned was a cave not far from the ruins of Bonkor. The local people simply call it Bunpuk, the Bonpo cave, and Geshe Geleg was keen to find out whether it could be the cave of the great Dzogchen master, Rongom Togme Jikpo. The biographies of the Shangsheng Ninju masters say that Rongom Togme Jikpo received the Shangsheng Ninju Dzogchen teachings from his root master, Tse Devaringmo. They also say he practiced in a cave where he saw neither the sun by day nor the moon by night. The texts also say the cave was located to the right of Bunkor. To their great delight, they discovered that the location and orientation of this cave exactly matched the descriptions in the texts. This was indeed the rocky hermitage of Rongom Togme Jigpo. Historical sources say that Yangtun Sherab Jaltsen 
met him and received Dzogchen teachings here, so we can be sure that this hermitage was a place of practice in the late 10th century. The group left the holy cave and went on to the ruins of the Bunpo settlement of Jaragang, only 400 meters to the west of Lomantang. The area is dotted with the ruins of stupas. One larger one is still standing, although the top has collapsed. The local people told the pilgrims many sad stories about the dark times of the religious wars between Buddhists and Bompos when all the relics from within the stupas were looted. Later on, when Geshe Geleg visited Sakya Namjal Gompa, an old monk showed him around the monastery and the Gun Kang, or Protector's Temple. Unfortunately, we were not allowed to film here but one of the holy items there is a huge copper pot. The old monk explained it had come from within the Jaragang stupa. He also said that according to legend, when the stupa was ransacked, the pot suddenly flew into the air by itself. It washed itself by falling into the river from where it was recovered and taken to the Namjal Sakya Monastery. The pot is still considered a holy object and the local people offer katas to it. Throughout this trip, Geshe Geleg was confronted by the ruins of so many monasteries, stupas and villages where his religion had once flourished and the local villagers had many heart-rending stories to tell the Lama about the black times. The thought that such atrocities had been committed in the name of religion saddened him deeply. But, seeking solace in his meditation, he remembered teachings on impermanence, so fundamental to both Buddhism and Bun path, and his sadness lifted. At other times, the Lama was elated at finding so many historical treasures. Until now, the group has been traveling all around Lomontang, but now we are heading back to Lower Mustang. As promised, the group went to Giling village to visit the Burn families there. They were given a warm welcome by Jigme Wangjal and his family. They are related to a branch of the Lubra Labon line, currently held by Lama Tsultrim. The founder of this Laburn branch, Drangsung Shiloh, came to this village some generations ago and was instated as a Laburn by the King of Mustang. Sanda se sanda na na ta twa na na luta pengi zimbi ta ronse shilo na na ta uto the family still keeps the original letter sent by the king proclaiming an official degree exempting the royal flaburn and his family from taxes and granting them special recognitions and freedoms that evening a reception was held here for Geshe Geleg's party and many local people came to greet the travelling Lama and discuss the current situation of the Bumpo population of this region. 
Lama Tsultrim and Dawa went back to Lubra, while Geshe Geleg and Norbu headed for Jarkot. The journey was easier now. The horses were sent back with Lama Tsultrim and Dawa, as they were no longer needed on the newly built roads of Lower Mustang. The first stop was the village of Jarkot. Jarkot is situated near Muktinath, a place highly revered by Hindus, Bunpos and Buddhists alike. Geshe Geleg's old friend, Nima, a Tibetan doctor, lives here and he kindly agreed to be their guide. Nima had also managed to arrange a meeting with a very important Hlabun of Lower Mustang, a man named Tsampa Takla. Like so many of the people they had met, Tsampa Takla was happy to share his story. He provides the community, both Bunpo and Buddhist, with ritual services such as rain calling, healing, rites for crop protection, worship of the Drabla and Pola ancestral gods. Tsampa Takla also takes care of an important Bunpo temple, Yundrung Changra Sha. This has been in his family for several generations. It is not clear exactly when this temple was established, but according to the Hlabun's information, it was at least six generations ago. Over the decades, the temple's fortunes have waxed and waned. It fell into disrepair and was rebuilt twice on different spots in the village. Laban Sampa Takla invited the group to visit one of two abandoned temples and he came across two large volumes of a text called Zermig. This is the medium version of the Buddha Tumpasherab's biography. <laughs> 
The volumes here are written in Dan Ying, the same writing system found in the famous Dun Huang manuscripts. There are also beautiful color illustrations showing people dressed in what is believed to be ancient Shangsheng traditional costume. The next port of call, Narakot, was far away, so the party joined a group of Hindu pilgrims who were traveling by jeep. There was no place inside the jeep, so Geshe Geleg and his friends traveled on the roof. At one point, the jeep got stuck in the Pendakola River was pulled free thanks to teamwork and they finally managed to cross over on a brand new bridge. Their route took them through Jomsom where they met some bombs. When she opened it up for Geshe Geleg's party, they were dismayed to see the sorry state of so many holy objects. Many of the statues were damaged. The texts were in total disarray their pages stuck together with damp and time. Undaunted, the team set about restoring order, cleaning the texts, wrapping them in clean cloths and stacking them respectfully on the altar shelves. Having finished their work, the group split up. The Lubra yogis went back to their village 
to prepare for the annual Dujab ceremony, an elaborate and festive ritual for the removal of obstacles and to call fortune. Meanwhile, Geshe Geleg and his companions headed back to Jomsom, the district capital of Mustang. In Jomsom, the group met Karchung, the curator of Yungdrung Kundrak Ling Temple. He kindly opened the temple for them. Yundrung Kundrak Ling was founded by Lama Tempa Jaltsen Rinpoche, who originally came from Tibet in the last century. The temple was filled with beautiful clay statues of the major deities of Bunpo Tantra, and Geshe Geleg and his companions were very pleased to see they were in such good condition. The group then went to circumambulate the nearby Tini Yungdrung Gompa. followed Bern, but gradually the knowledge of Bern declined as there were no longer any bumpos able to perform the rituals. So people began to follow the Nyingma tradition as there is a flourishing Nyingma monastery nearby. Several years ago, however, a local boy, Tenzin Jalpo, went to study in the Bern monastery in Dolanji, India. Like Geshe Geleg, he now has his Geshe degree, and the village elders hope that he will return one day to revive the traditional rituals and help take care of the temple. From a viewpoint above the village, Geshe Geleg and his friends looked out over the ruins of the royal palace of Jalpo Chensumpa, the king of Tini. He was the principal sponsor of the great Dzogchen master, Lubragpa Yangtung Tashi Jeltsen, from the Shangsheng Nianzhu lineage. When Tashi Jeltsen arrived to Lower Mustang, the king of Tini offered him land and properties for his spiritual center, which grew into the village of Lubra. Geshe Geleg's party have finally returned to Lubra to join the Dujab ceremony at the request of the yogis, lamas and villagers. The ceremony is to be held in Yungdrung Punsok Ling Gompa. That's the focal point of the local community. When Geshe Geleg's party arrived, they sat with the yogis who were relaxing drinking local barley beer and talking about the preparations for the ritual. They were very happy and joyful, joking and teasing. <laughs> then the preparations began in earnest. A whole day was devoted to fashioning extremely intricate and elaborate butter decorations for the Torma offering cakes. The Torma cakes themselves were made and the decorations were fixed onto them. Tormas serve as supports and offerings for the peaceful and wrathful deities. One very particular feature about these Tormas is that a ball of woolen thread is placed inside each of the two main ones. 
while some of the guardian tormas are bound with woolen thread. At the end of the week-long ritual, the tormas are divided and shared out among the villagers. The woolen thread is divided among them too, and it is considered a very strong protective amulet. Normally, a torma would fit on a plate, but these ones, made by the yogis here in Lubra, are immense, and so it takes three people to lift them carefully into place on the altar. dance for Ganapuja began and so all the local people gathered inside the temple. The villagers believe that upon successful completion of the Durgyab ritual all obstacles for the coming year such as natural disasters, diseases, famine and armed conflicts are removed and timely rain long life, good fortune and prosperity are all ensured. On the last day of this six-day ceremony, an effigy symbolizing all obstacles and disturbances is burned. Sesame oil is heated in a pot, and then alcohol is added, sending out a dramatic spurt of flames. The effigy is burned in this blaze, and everyone exclaims, Plagiolo! Victory to the gods! Then everyone receives blessings from the de, a ritual construction symbolizing the mandala of the divinities. The thread symbolizing harm is severed by the lama and people receive the water blessing which symbolizes the purification of obscurations.
<laughs> At the very end of the ritual, the ransom and the dir, accompanied by the cham dancers, are brought to the river and burned. The yogis perform a wrathful dance to subjugate negativities. Then they return with the Lama to the Dar Chen, the main flagpole, where they upturn the base of the Dur and perform the last wrathful dance to completely subjugate any negative energies which may have remained. At the conclusion, the local women, dressed in sumptuous traditional costumes and bearing alcohol, sing traditional songs of praise to the glorious yogi warriors who have overcome all demons. They offer the alcohol to the yogis and thus the ritual is completed. Now the time has come for Geshe Geleg to return to Kathmandu. The lamas, yogis and local people have come to bid their new friend farewell. The procession stops first at the Darchen flagpole, where traditional songs are sung. These songs are called Yangtze, songs of good wishes. A short offering of serchem and alcohol is sprinkled to the gods and guardians. Then, as the old women sing and dance, they process on to a walnut tree.
This tree was originally planted by the founder of the village, Lubdragpa Tashi Jeltsen. It is a very revered focal point. Finally, they reach the stupa, where everybody expresses their heartfelt wishes to see Geshe Geleg again. Under this rain of good wishes, Geshe Geleg sets out on his journey, bearing the hidden treasures of Mustang.